with that, I want to invite up the folks for the, what we're calling the Gov 2.0 panel. Uh, uh, who do I see? I see Jed. I see Andrew. You are obviously welcome to sit up, to come up. I think. Okay. All right. By the way, this is Andrew Roche. Andrew waved to everyone. Andrew is going to uh, uh, give our keynote, bleeding the Gov 2.0 panel into the uh, 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 copyright SOPA PIP panel. So we did a little bit of uh, everything in a hacker world is in perpetual beta. We hacked this panel a little bit. I think Matt just tweeted that out. Is that right? Uh, a little while ago. Yeah. Almost real time. Uh, how many of you are involved in civics and politics in some form or another? How many of you have used technology tools over the past uh, five years or so? How many of you have witnessed a radical evolution in the way that technology tools are used for civics and government? Uh, I should say, I chaired Obama's Internet Governance Working Group during the 08 campaign. Uh, and we were novices then. We were, uh, I mean, we were pioneers. We were doing some pretty profound things that no one had ever done before. I suspect that what we are doing, uh, what will happen this year, will dwarf anything that we did four, you know, four years ago. Um, so I want to make this as uh, much a dialogue as possible. I see Art's not here. All right, that's okay. Why don't we go down the row pretty quickly. Uh, we can start with you, John. Say who you are and what you do. And maybe say, if you can, what you find most interesting and on the horizon in the, at the intersection of technology and government, if you can. Think about that. If you don't have a thought right now, we'll come back to you on it. But I want folks to, think, to share with us their vision about very interesting things that, uh, interesting ways technology are transforming civics and uh, uh, voter participation in government, et cetera. Sure. Well, I'm John Bergmar. I'm with uh, Public Knowledge, and we are a public interest group in Washington, D.C. I'm an attorney there, and I work on copyright and telecom issues. I guess to answer the question, I think uh, one of the more interesting things is uh, how uh, different members of Congress are starting to use technology to engage with the public at large, and also to the extent that it's not really a, a partisan left-right issue. In fact, some of the most uh, forward-thinking uh, forward people on the use of technology uh, and on good policy on, on uh, high-tech and copyright issues have been from the Republican side of the aisle, which I think a lot of uh, law students are sometimes surprised to learn. My name is Benjamin Kalos. That's at K-A-L-L-O-S on Twitter. I'm expecting everyone in the audience to be looking down at their mobiles or iPads or whatnot and tweeting out this whole panel. This is hopefully the one place where you can do that, where people will not get offended. I am involved with a group called New Roosevelt. We are a political action committee devoted to removing corruption from government. We're also got a nonprofit we just started that is rewriting the New York State Constitution. And uh, when we're uh, not doing that, we're advocating for things like redistricting reform, which is a battle we sadly recently lost, and progressive tax reform, which is a battle we uh, can claim a small victory on. I think that what is most excited about is does anyone know about the open data bill in New York City? Can I just see a show of hands? So uh, for those of you that don't, uh, it just passed uh, very recently, back in February, February 29th. And what that means is uh, despite the current administration's protests, otherwise there will be a lot of data becoming available to the city of New York. And it will be becoming available, I think, as early as 2017. Woo! <laughs> But until then, there's a lot of lawyers in the room, and uh, as an attorney, I've used and abused FOIL to make a lot of information public from government voting records in the Assembly, Senate, and City Council, to you name it. So I think we're at a precipice where a group of people in this room, or even two or three of you, can go off, take government data, and use it for something very powerful. And I think that is what I'm looking forward to. I'm Jed Alpert. I'm with a company called Mobile Commons, and we're used very often in civic engagement and government-related activities, as well as with uh, non-governmental civic organizations and advocacy organizations. I think the most interesting things that we see, anyway, uh, going on are more in emerging democracies that are beginning to use technology, and not just technology for technology's sake, but using it to engage. They, they have the, the burden of now convincing people that they're legitimate governments and that they're serving uh, uh, interests, so for genuine participation and communication, um, much more and much more interesting than I think government initiatives that are going on here. 
Hi, I'm Matt Wood at Free Press. I'm the policy director there, also a lawyer sometimes. Uh, at least I used to be more so, but uh, now doing a lot of different things there. I, I, I don't know. I think the most interesting thing I'm seeing is you mentioned, Jonathan, the change that you saw in 2008, and of course everything changes every year, every month, every week on the internet. I, th I think at Free Press we do a lot of petitioning, and you know we use the traditional tools, emails to get people involved. The most interesting thing to me is the, the proliferation of channels, the way things are changing, and so now you do have members of Congress on Twitter, as John mentioned, and you have all these different ways to get to people as we're trying to use the technology in the ways that it's more natural for, to, to escape from channels rather than channeling the technology into a traditional model in the political sense, trying to let the politics map onto the, the technology and really you know, getting out of that rut where it's like the same thing again and again in each campaign. I think you see that now a lot more nimble campaigning when people are trying to make change, and hopefully that results in better policy or at least gives people more of a say in the policy, and it isn't just the same old thing again and again. We have new ways to try things all the time. Turn it on. Is Nancy Scola out there? Nancy? Nancy, Art, Art Chang isn't here. You have any interest in taking a seat? Yeah? All right, good. Uh, again, perpetual beta, putting people on the spot. Uh, I don't have Nancy's bio in front of me, but she, uh, what were you, the editor of uh, TechCrunch? The te tech president, rather, tech president. And uh, now writing for Atlantic, primarily? Okay, good. Uh, I think you're the perfect person to fill out the panel. In fact, we have no women, for what it's worth, on the panel, so I think that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, who, I'm sure we all know the quote, uh, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. <laughs> who thinks that's a positive statement about lawyers? <laughs> who thinks it's a negative statement about lawyers? All right. I think it was intended as a positive statement about lawyers. <laughs> so one person agrees with me, at least one person uh, admitted to agree with the say statement that let's kill all lawyers was a positive statement. I think what Shakespeare was trying to communicate in that concept was that, well, this, this was, a, a, I think it was, I forget the name, the butcher, Mike the Butcher or something, from Henry VI, who said, first thing we do, let's kill all lawyers. That was a proposition for an anarchic state. Some people might think that's a good idea. My attitude is that most revolutions, if they haven't been fully led by attorneys, certainly had the participation of at least forward-looking attorneys, and they certainly had attorneys there after the fact to clean up the pieces and reorder, reassemble the new society. So it's my hope here that you are those attorneys, that you're either the free-spirited, free-minded, free-thinking attorneys who know how to participate in the revolution, this inflection point that we're undertaking, or you're the attorneys at least who after the fact will be able to help the new revolutionaries as we reassemble the modern society. So on this panel, how many attorneys? Okay. The four originals, all attorneys, all doing cool things with technology to try to transform society. They have found their function as attorneys in the new world order, the emergent, or at least they're feeling their way around. I'm convinced that more than ever, we have a need for attorneys. How many law students do not have jobs next year? Oh, so, all right, a lot of you do. Good. All right, maybe this is the right audience. I like to think that students who study at the intersection of law and technology have a better, much better prospect of finding jobs that make sense in the 21st century. Uh, I think more than ever we have a need for lawyers, we just haven't figured out how to deploy you all. The question is how do we make sure you can get a vi make a viable living participating in this societal change? So some of that may come in the form of civics, some of it may help uh, come in the form of representing entrepreneurial startups, but for now we're going to talk about civics and the role of attorneys. Uh, Oh, Nancy, let me hand it over to you. What are you up to? Can you tell us uh, why Tech President was formed, what you did there, and what you're doing now, and uh, what you see uh, going on in the world of uh, technology and civics and government? Okay. Uh, Tech President was formed in 2007, I believe. Our publisher is in the second row, um, so I deferred him on the specifics. But it was basically to focus on uh, what seemed to be an emerging interest in the intersections of technology and politics. I worked on the Hill in the past um, until about 2005. And, you know, I did a bit of technology work and it was very, uh, you know, people really quite didn't understand what I did. Um, 
in terms of using the internet to get the work of the committee that I worked on out into the world. So there seemed to be some growing interest as we approached the presidential election in 2008 of the Obama campaign in particular, knowing how to use these technologies in ways that hadn't been done to open up the political process. And we thought, well, that's interesting. Let's kind of jump on it. Uh, it was neat as a writer because nobody else was reporting on this stuff. Um, it's been satisfying personally to see now that anytime the Obama campaign and the Romney campaign does something online, it's on the front cover of CNN.com. It's not great as a writer because you have a lot more competition, um, people being interested in this sort of thing. But uh, I left that president, went to work in part for The Atlantic, some other publications, because there had been, we sort of convinced the core group of people, these folks, some of you folks, about this idea that technology could be really useful in changing sort of how democracy works. And the idea now is to broaden it out to sort of normal folk. Um, if you're in this room, you're probably not normal folk in terms of having a real sort of, you know, being willing to spend your Sunday focusing on this stuff. So the idea now is how do we talk about the application of technology to politics in a way that's uh, appealing to people who aren't sort of steeped in it. And I think the technologists have done a really good job of that, to be honest. I mean, I think you hear, you know, Chris Hughes, and, who's the founder of Facebook, co-founder of Facebook, talking about this stuff now. A lot of the technology folks... And to be honest, my sort of sitting in the middle of some of these worlds, we don't have a real good legal backing on some of these questions that, um, that we're considering. So my interest in coming here today was, okay, now we need the lawyers to come in and say, you know, sometimes technologists say anything's possible, and the lawyers say nothing's possible. We kind of have to meet in the middle because some of this stuff, the reason it's been so hard is because there's, you know, a couple hundred years of, you know, legal history sort of um, handcuffing us. So we need some smart lawyers to kind of get into the mix and sort of figure out some of the real nitty-gritty stuff. Good. Yeah, I, I, call this, I call this yeah but lawyers in a why not world. Our goal in this room I think is to become the why not lawyers in a why not world. How can we become enablers instead of folks who stop it? Um, Jed, you uh, did a lot of work through Mobile Commons in 2008 I think with the, you know, uh, deploying your platform for all sorts of uh, uh, civic purpose, uh, all sorts of uh, campaign purposes. Is that accurate? Well, I put the civic engagement into two or three categories. One is government actually interacting with people around government issues, whether it's providing health care, really using technology to provide government services. A second area is in advocacy, which is engaging people, um, but typically organizations engaging people to take a position on something to influence politics. And then the third is politics, politicians communicating with each other either to stay in office or get elected into office. Those are three areas that we work in. One thing I'd say is that I think the best example right now of crowdsourced policy making, I was sort of thinking about it on the way over because it's sort of hard to actually find examples of it, is what's going on with bullying right now, where these large organizations are engaging lots of people, whether it's the Born This Way Foundation, the Human Rights Campaign, the, the teachers unions, all these other things are are, are, are using the media's interest in bullying to accumulate large groups of public, the public who are normally wouldn't be together to influence the direction of bullying legislation. That's, a, that's, a, that's probably the, the most exact example of, 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 of interest groups using crowd, using crowds who are, inter, who are, are going around one issue. With, it's not a left-right issue per se. I mean, a, large, uh, uh, what would be normally considered non-progressive organizations associated with the religious right and organizations um, associated with uh, uh, gay rights in the United States are, are, are beginning to agree on these issues and coming together to set the tone for what legislation in local and federal might look like. And I think that's the, um, that, that's a very good example. People often bring up like SOPA or PIPA, but really, and we were very, very involved in that, and it was a fantastic outcome, but really that was primarily a fight between two large business types, one old media, one new media, one who was able to leverage people much more effectively and much more and with a much better narrative than the other. But it wasn't I would not say there was a popular uprising around Topa and Pippa in the way that, that there is, you know, without Google and Tumblr and it was a fantastic result. And it was to block legislation. It wasn't to actually sort of come up and change the way people think about a, a, a particular issue in terms of creating the policy. So well, you know, when I first heard about what you, Mobile Commons, and other sort of mobile communications tools were doing in this area, 
maybe five or six years ago, I think is when I first heard, I, I didn't really get what you were doing. It was sort of, you know, and I'm someone who's involved in that world. I thought, I'm not sure if this is going to work. It seems not for the faint of heart. It seems not for, you know, we didn't have network effects. No one had smartphones. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have these other vehicles. You know, it, it was expensive to SMS at the time. I didn't know that. Well, it didn't work that well then either. Yes. So the, but the, uh, the, the, the thing was, like with most outcomes of technology, they're really quite simple, which is even then, lots of people had mobile phones. It was the way they were communicating. Right now, the number one way that people communicate on the planet, and including the United States, is by text messaging. And, the, and y y if you're going to try and engage people, you might as well engage them on the number one way that they're communicating. And when you can sort of tie that into the way that governments and organizations sort of create databases around people and have ongoing relevant two-way communications, you can sometimes get a very good result. With SOPA and PIPA and with the, the, the partnerships with uh, Tumblr and Engine Advocacy and other organizations, just using, many people had great success with that, just using our tools, in two weeks we generated a half a million calls to Congress. When you think there's only you know, a few hundred Congress people, probably some lawyers know the exact number, um, the, uh, uh, that's, the, that's a huge impact. Yeah, but you weren't a techie. No. Ten years ago. No. All right, so, so, but you saw I was, something. I was a lawyer. Right, what I always ask my students to do, especially the ones who are thinking maybe they're going to move out of law a little bit, is to find an area of the law or business where there's a confusing legal or regulatory overlay, a confused area, and then try to move your way in and create a venture around it. Is that what you did? Well, first of all, I had a partner, a business partner, who is an actual techie, okay. and which was helpful. <laughs> it remains helpful, but the, a lot of times there's a people who are very techy, in this, or, or, or there's a technology for technology's sake thing happening where where you're not connecting technology to some kind of outcome that might not be just building a list. But you know, some I think this happens less and less as more people become techies. But it it, it was very helpful to begin this with the, and our customers were often not particularly techy either, we're beginning this with useful outcomes using mobile phones and not sort of focusing on the fact that we're making fancy software that does all this stuff underneath it, but that, but that there was a, a, it was very outcome oriented, whether it was get out the vote or getting someone to a Nike store to buy a pair of sneakers or whatever it is, there was always a, a measurable, demonstrable outcome um, associated with the result of engaging people in that technology, as opposed to, you know, how many people signed up for a particular thing. You know, the the internal technology outcome rather than the 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 ultimate outcome. The core of what I want to get at actually is more your career trajectory. So you're someone who wasn't tech or uh, wasn't a technologist. You were a lawyer. People go to law school in part and don't go to business school. Don't become entrepreneurs. Don't become uh, innovators because they're a little bit risk averse. You took something that probably wasn't really going to be viable for several years. You quit the law. You persevered in this path because, and, and were essentially monomaniacally focused on this new path. Was that difficult for you? No, but I wasn't that good a lawyer. <laughs> okay. But I mean, it's true. That, like, r r r r lawyers never lose by saying no, right? They never, the, the, every, the, if you're an entrepreneur and you go to, and you raise some venture capital, the venture capitalists will talk to the lawyer, and the lawyer will always cite like 85 million legal problems as to why it can't possibly work, because there's no downside for the, for, for the legal profession to do that. But, the, uh, but also, when I started this company, it wasn't really as a business. I was just sort of taking an application that I had built, I had had built based on a deal I'd done with an entertainment law client of ours, and applied it to advocacy around uh, a Supreme Court issue in 2005, and it worked well. But the, there, there wasn't the intention of what a business might be around that. And because it worked well, it became obvious over time that there might be a business there. Um, but what, one of the great things about being a lawyer is that you got to see a lot of stuff when you're practicing law. You got to see how other people thought about business. And invariably, they're having more fun anyway, particularly around that time. What's happening? Um, who here thinks that we are about to 
enter a summer like we have not seen since at least 1968, if ever. <laughs> a couple of you. Who doesn't think that? All right, really? Okay. I think, we've got, I think we've got an incredibly radicalized population entering this campaign cycle. I think with the Occupy movement growing, with mobile social media tools proliferating, it's going to be a fascinating political summer for all of us. Um, actually, Ben, you are you're running for office. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what you, you're up to otherwise, what you anticipate this summer, not so much with your campaign, but through the, you know, what's going on with social media technology tools in uh, the summer of uh, the 2012 election? Uh, sh sure. I, I would love to actually speak to some of the things that you guys were, were speaking about just in terms of uh, the type of attorneys you should be, which is just uh, uh, in my role with New Roosevelt, we also I'm in-house counsel for a venture capital firm that funds it. And uh, one thing I'd like to suggest is be the can-do attorney. Those are the attorneys that are generally most successful. And what I generally try to do is quantify my answers in terms of likelihood of success combined with the number of hours. So somebody will say, can we do the impossible? And the answer is generally, of course we can. It's going to take this many hours, and this is the likelihood of success, and odds are we're going to win on appeal, which is this far out. And uh, what, when you say that and you quantify things in that way with your clients, a lot of the times they may not be brave, but every now and then they'll surprise you and say, you know what? There's not that much difference in terms of the hours. Let's go for it. So th there's a huge opportunity. In terms of this summer, uh, in addition to being uh, a candidate and running this PAC, I'm also involved with the DNC and a group called Democratic Lawyers Council. So uh, the DNC is uh, ramping up. They're starting their own super PACs and getting those involved. So uh, everyone's moving forward on that. So you're going to see a lot out of the Obama campaign and trying to reinvigorate that base. And I, I do think that when you have the Occupy movement still active and uh, trying to find new locations to get out there. It's a lot easier to be out there when it isn't winter. So I, I think that the visibility for Occupy should return. And uh, in terms of the social media tools for the Obama campaign, I think we'll continue to see them uh, press on those. And uh, just using the tools that are out there, there's a new tool called uh, gotaregister.org, which is being run by the DNC. So a lot of that is taking technology and moving it towards real-world results. And uh, what we've seen throughout the United States in at least 20 states is changes to voting laws, specifically voter identification. And uh, I was sitting with a couple of members of Congress and the DCCC and folks, and they were talking about the fact that the number is 4 million people uh, registered to vote for Obama, and they were in the minority communities, and 20% of those people have moved. Uh, on top of that, they registered in 2008, and still since then, uh, we now have voter ID laws where you need a state identification to vote, and uh, those laws are pretty onerous. So there's a huge initiative being launched to try to figure out how to get those voters, turn them out a second time for Obama, get them the identification that they need to vote, and then track the 20% of them that have moved since the last election. So in, in that, there's a lot of data being played with a lot of open uh, freedom of information law requests going out and just trying to identify those voters and get them out and motivated in whatever way they can. So, so if you were, if you were at, uh, 2L in law school or someone about to sit for the bar, what would you be doing th this summer? So I, I actually have a Brooklyn Law student who uh, is graduating and uh, he's uh, the, uh, he, he's an intern with New Roosevelt, and he's also the president of the National Law Dems. And uh, I believe what a lot of, uh, what his initiative, his name is Ted Anastasiu. Does anyone in this room from Brooklyn Law School know him? Perfect. So uh, the, the piece that he's really pushing for is trying to convince law students who just sat for the bar in July. So, so you sit for the bar in the last week of July, and a lot of you go on a bar trip. And what would be more fun as a bar trip than going down to Florida, Pennsylvania, or Ohio for a month to uh, get involved in a campaign and assist with voter protection and uh, getting people out to vote and possibly even getting involved a little bit further down ballot on congressional campaigns. Uh, as a person who's worked in politics, what generally happens is uh, 
if you're involved in a campaign and you work really hard, it turns out that law students and lawyers really work hard, uh, a job offer tends to come out of it. And uh, any campaign that is worth their salt will, uh, after you've worked really, really hard, say, hey, do you want to take your hand at doing some policy work or legislation on the other side of the election? So it's a great opportunity to get involved on a congressional campaign or even a local campaign. At the same time as there's Obama and uh, congressional races, in New York State we have our entire assembly and our entire Senate up for grabs. So there's 212 uh, incumbents defending their seats. And whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, there's somebody on your side of the aisle. And uh, in those campaigns, uh, they're, they're so small. And uh, something I, I want to put to you is uh, never attribute to uh, malice that which can which be attributed to incompetence or something else. Uh, I, I remember uh, I was a chief of staff in the assembly, and we were writing the, uh, and, and I got in, and I said to my boss, hey, can we do an open source tax credit? And he said, sure, why not, just do it. So I, I Googled it, and it turned out that Carl Malamud put out a proposal on it. So I uh, pick up the phone and try to call Carl Malamud, and of course he wants to do everything by email, as does, do most technologists. But uh, I remember this recurring theme where I said, hey, Carl, I have the go ahead. I'm going to take your proposal, turn it into legislation. And I kept pushing back and be like, you can't write legislation. Somebody up there in the ivory tower in Congress or somewhere else has to draft this legislation. I was like, no, no, anyone can draft legislation. And I remember going through this and reaching out to ESR and RMS and everyone and uh, getting it out there. And just for the record, it's the free, it's the FOSS and open source because of, of course, the two different movements and in recognition to both of the respective uh, movements. But um, any of you in this room can draft legislation. Uh, you're going to be doing it later today, hopefully. So uh, be empowered, draft it. Go to a campaign and say, hey, I think that this legislation is really important for our constituency right here in this district. And uh, you'd be surprised by the results. Sometimes they're not understanding the legislation. Sometimes they haven't introduced it. Sometimes nobody's written it just because there wasn't anyone in the room who could understand the underlying situation to write it. How many in this room are currently involved in a political campaign and Tea Party movement and the Occupy movement? Raise your hand. How many of you have uh, want to be but don't know how to tap into it? A few of you. you know, I used to run mass defense, mass defense for the National Lawyers Guild back in the 90s off and on. And we had none of these tools. It was strictly, you know, uh, the civil rights lawyers trying to do damage control at the events, the various events. This time round for Occupy, it's been a little bit of a secret, but my students and I have done a lot of the um, social media, copyright, online support work for the Occupy movement. This, uh, because this was the piece that the movement was oblivious to. So to the extent that you are tech-oriented attorneys, you are in unbelievable demand. The question is whether or not anyone's going to be paying you to do these tasks. But I got to say, when I was in law school, I worked for a member of Congress, and I would have done it for nothing. And it has served me well for the rest of my career. So frankly, at this point, if you have the latitude to get involved in any political campaign or any political movement, and this is a path you want to take, this is the time to do it, and this is time to do it cheap. Um, Art just joined us or a while ago. Art, do you want to tell us uh, who you are and what you're up to? And part of the, uh, Art was sort of a, a big influence in this panel because Art has really been trying to assemble a lot of the tech-oriented policy folks in the New York community to try to do some stuff in advance of the next round of elections. Perfect, thanks. So um, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, I wear, um, I'm the founder and CEO of Tipping Point Partners. Um, I'm also the uh, founder and CEO of a company called App Orchard, and also the CEO of another company called Cookster. Um, and as you might guess, um, Tipping Point um, starts companies where software can provide a way to um, engender social or economic change in industries and in government. Um, in this particular um, setting, I'm here as, as probably two roles. Um, I'm a Bloomberg appointee to the New York City Campaign Finance Board, which many of you may know as the largest public financing program for candidates for public office in the municipality in the world. Um, I'm also the chair of a committee that is run under the auspices of the CFB uh, called the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, a relatively obscure 
um, committee, which probably deserves to be has deserved to be obscure, um, but was recently combined with the CFB um, as of last year through a charter amendment. Now, when when you look at New York City, and its population of eight and a half million people, or eight and a quarter, depending upon whose numbers you believe, um, you think that voting would be a big deal. With the number of folks in this room, with the civic organizations, um, with the folks that you know, people like Jed have been able to successfully tap and activate, you think that we'd start to be, be one of the most politically active cities in the country. But that's not the case. I mean, our voter participation has been among the lowest of any large city in the United States across all demographics, across every single political spectrum, and you ask the question, why? Why is that? And maybe there's not a national question to be asked, but certainly in the context of New York City, there's a question to be asked of why we think it's okay to have 20% turnout of registered voters in local elections. Why it's okay to have slightly better than that in national elections. And why do we have to live in an environment where people are obviously feeling so disconnected from their elected government that they are not gonna turn out and actually participate? So we stepped back and asked a couple questions. And we have a, we have a, we have a fantastic team, by the way. Um, Anita Coward Mayers is um, uh, head of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, head staff person, and doing a, a tremendous job with just a couple staff resources to continue outreach to the community. But if you're going to do outreach, you have to do it at scale. And what does that mean? For a city of this size, you inevitably need to turn to something which is very, very profound, like technology. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Jed over the past few years and seeing, what, seeing the amazing successes that he's had because he's taken a tool that has been able to reach the pockets of virtually every single person in New York City, combine them with the power of speech um, in the 140 character message, and be able to activate people across the system to, do, to take action and to participate. What he's doing is, is on the verge of something that we're trying to tap. Um, we believe that technology has the potential to be able to connect people to their, with each other, to help them surface issues, identify those issues, and then to be able to find like-minded people. And through the aggregation of those people, surface numbers that then can have resonance with the elected officials who represent them. I mean, that's basically the, 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 the foundation of our democracy. And to remind elected officials why they represent them and what these folks really care about. And then to use that technology and those numbers to begin an informed, moderated discourse between people who represent them in government and the actual people themselves. Now, we don't have a silver bullet. And so one of the things that we've done over the past um, six to nine months has been to try to figure out what other people are doing. And um, we've been able to pull together an amazing group of people um, from the grassroots, from amazing civic technology organizations, many of which I'd never heard of, um, to technology firms, to um, you know, the, the, the amazing support that the largest technology firms, including Google and Tumblr, are, are putting in this area. Um, and then also to um, some of the major foundations and other thinkers in the area who are, who are really interested in this. So I don't know if there's going to be a major spring this summer in terms of popular sentiment, but there is a growing recognition among people who actually have the power, ability, money, and talent to act that the time is now to do something. Um, and so we're trying to figure that out. And you can find out a little bit more about what we're doing at um, demtech.squarespace.com. Um, you know, I kind of envy you folks who are graduating from law school now or have recently graduated. Uh, it, it's a mixed blessing, but you have the opportunity to change the world in a way that my generation did not. We've got, we're fortunate to have uh, John and Matt from, uh, uh, 
from free press and public knowledge here who are doing a lot of the uh, uh, heavy lifting down in DC. I was in DC for eight years. When I left, it was a, I, I felt a lot of uh, sort of DTs, I guess. I felt like I was uh, uh, outside sitting on the sidelines while they were fighting the good battle. Uh, so I wonder if the two of you could share with us what you're up to these days. Well, I know you're working on several projects that are harnessing technology for civic good. Sure, I'll talk about the, our internet blueprint project. Like a lot of people after SOAP and PIPA, which is all about stopping something, the question is, oh, well, what can we do? Um, so, you know, periodically there's this controversy. Right now it's about ALEC, where, where all of a sudden the general public might find out that members of Congress and their staff don't actually write the laws that they pass, that, it's, that they're put together by experts. So we decided, instead of coming up with some sort of like broad level principles for internet policy making and copyright and telecommunications, we would actually uh, try to use a, a hybrid crowdsourcing model to produce draft legislation, like actual bills that look like bills that you can actually introduce in Congress, not just an idea of what a bill should do, but operative language that's formatted right. But of course, you know, the general public in a crowdsourcing uh, endeavor is not really that good at coming up with specific bill language, so we came up with this hybrid model where people can submit general ideas and then different groups, not just public knowledge, but also you know, a group like Free Press or Center for Democracy and Technology could sort of step in and sort of adopt a proposal and move it up to the next level. And doing that, we've just started and we have like seven or eight uh, draft bills and we've had our own particular challenges based on the fact that we are not coders at public knowledge and it's sometimes hard. Like we have all these great ideas for bills and process and what can be done to improve the law but we don't necessarily have the ability to roll out you know, a, a collaborative uh, bill writing platform. Good, and I'm hopeful that Sherwin, your colleague, will follow yeah. up on that concept in the Hack the Act discussion and in our Hack the Act yeah. workshops. And, and there's a, you know, I, I can't let it, we, we'd like to move the, Congre the congressional lawmaking process to like a government 2.0 model and that's where, you know, that, that's where that work is focused on. But uh, a big problem also is that a lot of policy making, particularly along intellectual property, is not even at the government 1.0 level, where policy making is not made by elected officials and no one knows who it is and no one knows who decided what and how language gets passed and it's done through uh, trade agreements which are negotiated in secret, uh, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and ACTA. Uh, the secrecy model is because, well, you know, if countries are negotiating over iron tariffs or steel issues, maybe you don't want those numbers to be circulated before they come to a final number. It's really troublesome when substantive laws are being negotiated in this trade process, and we don't even have the basic level of accountability of knowing of the public being aware who is deciding these policies which will affect uh, global IP. So. so you triggered some momentum in the number one question on our live question board, which is essentially, even if we create these platforms, if outside organizations create these platforms, how do they actually resonate with members of Congress? I mean, you know, you've got Daryl Issa who's got his open act platform that allows for some degree of commenting from the public, limited to some extent, but why should your, uh, you know, non-government platforms succeed in, uh, if Congress can create their own viable platforms? Are they just too far behind the curve, the technology curve? And if so, how does yours gain the necessary momentum to be relevant on the Hill? Well, obviously that's what we're trying to figure out since we just launched this, but I don't really see that it's going to be a, uh, we're going to have a bill, we're going to present it to Congress and it's going to pass, particularly not in an election year. But if you can get junior members of Congress, maybe someone like uh, Jared Paulus or you know, someone who's very technologically enthusiastic to sort of look at a bill and introduce it. It might give it some legs and you just very, very, very slowly change the debate. And you have, by having language, uh, we, ha we just have a lot more and varied ideas for draft legislation than I think any one member of Congress is going to come up with. So it's sort of pollinating DC with these various proposals. Uh, some of them might not even work together. You might, you know, it might be a choice. You can do this one or that one or not both. But, so but, are there turf wars? I know you, and, uh, you know, free press and public knowledge, CDT, you know, all, all the folks that's on that side of the equation work pretty cohesively together. You've built your platform or other similarly situated uh, uh, nonprofits on your side doing similar platforms? Are there uh, folks on the other side of the equation creating their own alternative platforms? And uh, maybe Matt can take that or share his thoughts. Well, you notice we can't actually sit next to each other because otherwise... Yeah. 
Um, no, I mean, I think there are some turf wars. Everybody's sort of trying to get into the same space of what do we do now? What, what does SOPA mean? What does PIPA mean? What does the, how do we capture that momentum and capture that energy? I've heard one person say, how do we keep the fear alive for Congress um, and make sure that they know that people can actually rise up and make a difference in the process? Um, I, it, it's good. I mean, it, the refreshing thing for me about SOPA was, and the outcome especially, but the, the process too, was that it wasn't a strictly partisan debate. And that maybe that sounds like such a baby step. You know, wow, you have people on different sides of the aisle actually agreeing on a policy. That seems like it should happen more often, but it was one of these rare cases, especially in what used to be not a very partisan space. Technology policy wasn't strictly R's over here, D's over here. And you know, we finally cracked through that and got back to that point in time. So I don't know if there really is another side in this debate. A lot of groups came together, both right-leaning and left-leaning, if you want to assign those labels, around SOPA and PIPA. I think, I think Jed phrased it perfectly, though, before. I mean, I think that's where, and where something like to answer your question about how does the Internet blueprint get momentum. If you read the trade press or the tech press even, a lot of the times you're going to see, oh, SOPA and PIPA was nothing but a horse race, a typical battle between Northern California and Southern California. Silicon Valley wanted one thing, Hollywood wanted the other. That's not true. There were a lot of real people involved. But, you know, we do have a sort of romanticized version of it, too, where we say it wasn't about that at all. It was about Internet users rising up. Wikipedia went dark. People took back the Internet and really made noise as Internet users for the first time and, and brought themselves into that debate. That's not true either, and that's why I think the way Jed talked about it was exactly right. It was really a combination of those two. And I think that's the exciting thing about technology and the way something like PK's Internet Blueprint gets momentum is by actually bringing people into the process and, and having a, not only a loud voice but a credible voice in Washington and showing that, you know, we can do this and you better listen to us because we can do it as well or better than you. I guess that's the only thing I would, I, would, uh, I noted when John said, you know, you can't crowdsource statutory language. We haven't yet, but maybe you can actually. So we'll see how people do when they get to actually writing this stuff down. Yeah, look, that's going to be the experiment this afternoon and through the week. Will we succeed or fail in crowdsourcing new legislation? Uh, I'm hopeful that the next panel will be a very balanced discussion on the successes and failures of SOPA PIPA battle and where it's going. Frankly, to be candid with you all, the cynic, the realist in me, is pretty well convinced that Congress now sees dollar signs in its eyes and doesn't give a damn about SOPA PIPA copyright being resolved anytime soon. This, to their mind, is a B-list item that the public is not screaming for resolution on, and it's a vehicle by which they can sign, uh, line up with Hollywood, or they can line up with the, you know, just line up with uh, Los Angeles, or line up with Silicon Valley, and draw uh, endless amounts of money for their campaign coffers for the next few Congresses, at least. Agree? They wanna, disagree? They want to line up with both, so they have a, they have an incentive to try to put the two together. You know, they'd like to get money from both, or at least a lot would, and I think that's the challenge: is to come together and get get beyond defeating something and shooting something down. I mean, I think the way you phrase this whole constructed this whole panel is interesting because law is so often about, if you're a can-do lawyer, you're not necessarily prescripting things and telling people what you can do. You're trying to knock down the yeah buts. You're trying to knock down the restrictions. And so I think that's what has to happen is a way to knock down the restrictions that doesn't actually knock down people's rights as well as content creators. And you know, I think it, it, hacking in the legal sense is probably a, a lot like hacking in the computer sense where you're not necessarily building something. You're getting around restrictions and getting around things you've been prohibited from doing before. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, by the way, I guess uh, apparently people need to speak closer to the mic. And uh, Jed, it looked like you had a comment. Well, uh, this may be the final comment, too, because we're running out. I just think the, the ALEC model is very, I think, very appropriate. And I don't think ALEC, it's been interesting, everyone now kind of knows what ALEC is, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for ALEC that doesn't necessarily crowdsource the specific words in the legislation, but that crowdsource that uses. The, it, its constituency, which hopefully is everyone who isn't uh, Exxon Mobil, to, uh, uh, to advocate for the positions that they take. So it's almost like crowdsourcing the values of, of ALEC rather than necessarily crowdsourcing. I mean, it's really hard to write legislation. It's very, you, you, but, but by, by telling those narratives. And that's, that's really this, part of the story, anyway, of SOPA, which is it's not. It's not Northern California versus Southern California. That's a kind of a false narrative, right? That that helps build support for, for SOPA, but the uh, but it but it's 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 the but it is the people interested in promoting, getting preventing SOPA or PIPA from happening, l using that narrative and leveraging hundreds of thousands and millions of people, and the ability for a group of, a, a, a group that is advocating for specific legislation. To, to capture people that way so they can be engaged on an ongoing basis to fight for the, the, the counter ALEC um, uh, uh, legislation. I know one, uh, Andrew Friedman, I forgot the new organization, but who used to run Make the Road, 
is setting up a new organization kind of with that in mind of um, a, a popular form of ALEC where they can be drafting legislation and, and, and creating popular support for it um, at, at the outset, both at the local and, and, and national level. But I think that's where the immediate opportunity is, not that there's never an opportunity to crowdsource legislation. Looks like Ben has a final thought. Uh, if anyone else has a final thought, Ray, I give me a little sign here. Sure. So uh, I just got back from a roadshow across New York State with a Democrat and a Republican. We agree, they, they agreed on nothing when it came to the actual policies, but when it comes to process, everyone agrees that the system is broken, there needs to be more transparency, and we need money out of politics. Uh, and in terms of legislation, uh, I'm going to go back to what Jonathan was just saying about come, come to this with a, a fresh mind. Uh, we need to re-examine our premise. Why does statute, everyone on this panel seems to be thinking, statute needs to be something that can't be crowdsourced or that shouldn't be readable or writable by non-lawyers? Abandon that presumption. Uh, maybe our legislation needs to be plain language. Why do you need to hire a lawyer and pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars to tell you what your law says? Take your law back, let's put it in plain language, and make it so that anyone can understand it. All right. Thanks, folks. Now, uh, I, should, I want folks to know that uh, I'm hopeful that most of these folks, I know Art has to leave, a few others may have to leave, but I'm hopeful that they'll be here to help us through the workshopping process. These are wonderful expert minds that know about the intersection of technology and civics. I've also prevailed upon Professor Larry Solon to be here, who does not know technology, but does teach statutory uh, 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 laws surrounding statutory construction, uh, uh, legislation, regulatory law and all that, and also is an expert in linguistics. So he's also going to be floating around today to give us some help as we try to hack the act. Um, and with that, I want to leave you with Arthur C. Clarke's third law of prediction. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. This afternoon, let's try to create some legal hacking magic. Create that platform, that crowdsourced capability that we didn't think could be done this morning, but maybe next week we'll, think, we'll realize it can actually be done.